Hello, and welcome to another edition of Your Therapist Needs Therapy. I am your host, Jeremy Schumacher, licensed marriage and family therapist. And today we have a very special guest, someone who I've been looking forward to uh, having a conversation with, someone whose work was really influential in my early career and continues to impact the type of therapist that I am today. Today I'm joined by Dr. Sheila McNamee. Sheila is a professor emeritus at University of New Hampshire in communications, someone who has been a major academic force in the field of social construction and postmodern therapy, is a founding member and current vice president at the Taoist Institute. Sheila, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Jeremy. It's uh, it's great to be here. I'm honored to be invited, and I look forward to our conversation. So I am familiar with your work, and I'm, I, I think I have a lot of listeners who do therapy, uh, at the therapy podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how you kind of got into the field working with therapy um, working around education and, and educating therapists, kind of what your journey to get into this field? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of stories <laughs> to be told about that. But um, basically, uh, when I was doing my PhD work uh, in the field of communication, um, I just I became interested in family therapy. And uh, probably the real reason is because I'm from a large family. And um, in my family of six children, two parents, um, I was sort of the the middle person and the mediator and the peacekeeper and um, that sort of uh, identity followed me into my friendships, you know, in school, having being friends with the um, you know, the, the hippies in those days, and then also the jocks, and, you know, how do you navigate these two very different communities of people, and it's sort of, so, like, I guess I've always saw myself and continue to see myself always in this liminal space between different communities, between different identities, um, and so forth, and so, um, I, I was drawn to, to family therapy and um, started taking family therapy classes during my PhD uh, coursework. And then, you know, I would uh, I had the privilege of sitting behind the one way mirror that we used to use in those days. And I was just like totally fascinated. And I um, I wrote my PhD dissertation on the therapeutic process. And I was lucky enough to um, meet Carl Tom from the University of Calgary. And uh, he invited me to Calgary as a research associate in the last year of my PhD. And so that's where I actually uh, collected my data. I interviewed families and therapists about the therapeutic process up there in Calgary. And, um, and while we were there, um, he had a big conference with the Milan team, Gianfranco Cecchin and Luigi Boscolo and Umberto Maturana and Heinz von Forster and like all these names it, the, that it was a very exciting time. So I guess I was sort of marked <laughs> through that whole process that this was this was my interest. And, you know, from a communication perspective, I felt I had some a, a different way of looking at the therapeutic process. And that kind of just grew and developed from, from there. I mean, I was, uh, because of the conference in Calgary with the Milan team, I was invited to Italy in 1986 as a visiting professor. Um, and I was there for several months. And so, you know, just one thing led to another because while I was in Italy, of course, I was able to, um, hang out at the Milan Center and watch families, you know, in therapy and just, you know, talk with people and stuff. So um, I feel I've had a very privileged life, actually, and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for the trajectory and I don't take any of it for granted. Yeah, just just a, a long list there of kind of the heavy hitters in, in the postmodern uh, therapy field, which is very cool. Uh, for you, was it kind of a paradigm shift or was it like this made more sense, kind of the approach and some of the postmodern work uh, around social construction? Did that make sense or was that like a paradigm shift happening in real time for you? Yeah, no, it was not a paradigm shift. It was so 
uh, the people that I was studying with, uh, Vern Cronin and Barnett Pierce in the communication discipline, were, you know, I I fell into that uh, embarrassingly. I'll say I went into communication because I thought I wanted to go into advertising. So, <clears throat> um, but then I met them, and it was uh, I had studied as an undergraduate philosophy, and and their approach was very philosophical and challenging the modernist individualist ideology and it just was it resonated with me uh, it's sort of sort of who i was so for me it was never a paradigm shift it was like find finding a home and putting sure. names and labels to a set of ideas that i, I feel i had just always been living yeah i think that's so so interesting looking at it i mean getting to work with some of the the early pioneers in the field but for me coming at it much later like i was in grad school in 2009 2010 and i had all this evidence-based practice i went to university of minnesota which is a huge research institution i was at marquette university which also doing a lot of evidence-based practice and i remember just kind of being like but that a lot of this stuff isn't useful in the room like that's not how i'm doing therapy theory is only so helpful to technique is only so helpful and i i read uh harleen anderson's book uh language uh conversation language and possibilities and i was like oh right this is what this is what my brain's been trying to do and so i think it's it's interesting at in my generation of therapists working with people who are looking at it as this huge paradigm shift and for me it was always like this just makes more sense this just fits better yeah. um so i think it's it's interesting and i i started doing marriage family um therapy that's that was what i went into immediately that's how i learned that was my internship site during um postgrad so or during my master's degree so that worked better i think for me where i was looking at it from a systems perspective right away but really needing that kind of postmodern social construction piece to make it make more sense yeah yeah yeah, you know, I mean, it, I think that that's a common uh, thing that happens to people where they're introduced to these ideas and they say, oh, there's a name for this, you know, what I've been thinking all my life. Um, you know, teaching under my undergraduates, you know, many of them, of course, struggle with these ideas and, and just get angry, actually, with me for trying to tell them, you know, that maybe their diagnosis isn't the best way to go, you know, it, it forward or what have you. But um, but then there are those who just say, oh, yeah, this is okay. This is great. This is this this resonates with me. So I, I think there's a lot of people like that. And thankfully, um, you know, there's so much it's become more and more normal. I think uh, I would like to think that these ideas are not so foreign. To people, and yet we still know that we're living in this um, pretty traditional, uh, old-fashioned, and straight-jacketed idea about what therapy is, what it should be, um, and in and of itself, therapy as a as a profession is pathologizing. I mean, it 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 actually, I think, in most cases, makes things worse for people, and what occupies me these days is, you know, wondering, should therapy really be taking place in a consulting room or in a clinic? Um, you know, should we, shouldn't we be out, you know, with all the, the issues in the world today, like, you know, climate change, uh, white mm -hmm. supremacy, authoritarianism, um, just, well, the list goes on and it's depressing, but, you know, shouldn't we be doing things because the, the, I believe those larger macro issues are the source of people's personal challenges and the challenges that they confront in their everyday interpersonal relationships. It's not something wrong with them. It's it's these larger issues. So, you know, I, I'm I I love all these ideas and and I think they're they're like a call to action to to be more social activists than. I mean, that's maybe a better name identity than therapist, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I find uh, the therapy and working in the profession, like I own my own practice now because the the rigid structure, I think 
made worse by insurance companies and, and the medical model uh, overlapping a lot of what therapy is supposed to be about um, has made it hard to practice in a way that's helpful for people that's not pathologizing. If you're only getting reimbursed by a certain diagnosis, like as a family therapist doing couples work, I couldn't get paid for having a relational diagnosis. Like you had to use the proper diagnosis in order to get paid. And I think that is is a huge hindrance. hindrance. And the, the field of psychology, I like to say, is always kind of behind where philosophy is. If you're looking at postmodernism in the 60s, and here we are in 2020, in the 2020s, still trying to figure out how to apply some of these things or make it more known that these things might work better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I. I I know I so so many thoughts coming into my head at once now, but um, I you know I think the reason that so many the evidence based practice and the medical model has such a grip is because people feel uncomfortable with uncertainty, and but but the fact is, and I. I don't use the word fact very often, but but the fact is that we there we live among so much multiplicity, so much diversity. How could anyone ever be certain that you know X is the right thing to do in Y situation? That there's just so many ways of looking at things, but modernism and individualism just make life easy for people it's you know do this and and that will happen and um you know it it it, it that applies on the personal level it applies on the professional level you know you will be a good teacher if you do x y and z you'll be a good therapist if you do blah 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 you know and and um it's just easier and it's it's not comfortable for people to uh question themselves you know, we've mm -hmm. been trained as, as a, you know, to become professionals who are absolutely certain. We have certainty about what we do. That's what makes us a professional. I know what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, what liberation as a professional say, wow, I don't know what the heck's going on here. And I'm not quite sure what to do. And, and in that way, you know, you invite those you're working with into kind of talking it through you know talking through what's going on and getting multiple perspectives out there in the open um so yeah we're just i it is kind of depressing to to ask the question will this uh hold on certainty and the modernist stance ever recede or is it here to stay forever and ever yeah and and i think <laughs> I draw I draw hope from the younger generations just around some of the things with uh, moving away from the medical model, moving away from gender binaries and other social constructs as inherently useful and kind of questioning, hey, I don't know that this fits that well for me. What other options are there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I agree with you that the there's I, th I think there's a a both and I think that there's younger generation who you know are eschewing all the entrapments of what uh, what allegedly is normal <laughs> and expected right but then there's also and I have conversations with a lot of my close friends and colleagues who are in the field the mental health field about how you know going back to the late 70s and early 80s when you know it was just so exciting to be in these conversations with you know what was happening with the Milan guys and with second order cybernetics and all of this stuff it was so exciting and what we see is that it that excitement is there for very few young people now um, I was on a PhD dissertation that it really like it, it was just like, I just, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my research and write this dissertation and get my degree so then I can have my job and get paid and live my life. And, <clears throat> you know, unfortunately, that, I mean, I feel so lucky that I was part of this, what felt like a revolution at the time. And I, it saddens me that while there is, you know, some cluster of young people who are revolutionary now, thankfully, that there are also a whole lot who are not. They just, you know, it's a job. I'm training for a job. 
Yeah. And I, I do think a, a revolutionary period will be good. I think uh, we look at something like deaths of despair being on the rise. I think statistically we're seeing all these different places where the, the modernist rigid structure is harming people. Like we objectively can say, this isn't helping. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, it, it, the other issue here and why I think the, the work that we do is so important is really bringing us back in a way to the sense of community, you know, away from staunch individualism, you have to take care of yourself. And, and that's, I mean, that really is where therapy comes from, right? You know, I've got a problem. So I go to you, my therapist, I don't bother my family or my friends with my problems because, you know, I can pay somebody who's going to help me. And then I can like insert myself back into those relationships. Um, and what we're talking about and why I think we need to question, are we are we using the old model of going into a clinic or a consultation room with our new ideas, not so new, but I mean, but with these ideas of, um, you know, that we're relational beings and in collaborative uh, dialogic engagements with each other, with a therapist, you know, we can make some changes. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it's just, I, I, we we want to re-establish or recreate the centrality of community and of relations, and it's really hard to do that. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was uh, reading one of your early papers. I think it came out in in ninety three or ninety four, um, prepping for this conversation, and it it was so fascinating to read because the internet wasn't expansive the way it is now yeah and this idea of of community and you know there were mentions of email and, and digital communication but like the way that social media exists now i don't think very many people saw coming and so this idea of community is very open-ended i just don't know that there's a lot of uh i don't want to say agreement but but the way it gets used varies so wildly from demographic to demographic yeah yeah. But I mean, I, you know, it reminds me of uh, Bob Putnam's uh, book, old book now is in the 90s, uh, Bowling Alone. Are you familiar with that book? I don't think so, no. So he did this uh, great research, you know, it was, he had a big checklist, uh, but basically, <clears throat> You know, he, it started by noticing like no one joins a bowling team anymore or bowling club and people don't, you know, women don't go to the women's club and men don't go to the Elks or the Moose and, and this and that. And so he developed this um, survey of, you know, with questions like, how many times a week do you have coffee with a neighbor? Um, how often do you do this, do you do that? You know, a number of things. And basically, you know, then correlated health statistics with uh, less and less connection with other people, or death with, uh, you know, people dying earlier, those who had less and less connections. And then there on top of that, so that's old research, but it's really fascinating to me. And then uh, Johan Hari, I don't know if you um, are familiar with his book that he wrote, I think it was around 2015 called Chasing the Screen and it's about addiction. And um, he traveled around the world and basically, you know, there's a lot to be said about that book, but, but the neoliberal impulse towards isolation um, is, you know, in his view and, and many others view Co highly correlated with addiction. It's not. It's not that your brain gets hijacked by chemicals and stuff. It's really about isolation and being alone. And and when you think about the contemporary culture, the neoliberal culture that we live in today, you know there are lots of people who make the point of saying, "Look, everybody has their own bedroom now." You know, you before everyone had their, a TV, their own TV in their room. Now they don't need it because they have their their own computers, their laptops, their devices, etc. But and house houses, you know, for those 
of means, you know, got bigger and bigger and bigger so that people had more of their own space. And so you can just see these measures of, you know, whether the addiction is addiction to drugs or to gambling or to shopping or to eating, or it doesn't matter that these are, these are the sorts of things that, that, uh, people, uh, turn to to fill themselves up which reminds me of another great article by another wonderful uh his uh, psychology historian uh philip cushman wrote a piece in the 80s called why the self is empty and he talks about you know all of these things that we do like shopping and eating and drugs and alcohol and things you know to kind of fill this emptiness and that therapy isn't isn't what are we doing therapeutically to to kind of change that what we should be doing is the things that i think we're interested in which is how do you build community how do you emphasize the relational aspect of our being and and help people survive in that way yeah yeah and and it's as a systemic thinker it's so fascinating to look at it because in a relational sense, it, from my perspective, in the therapy room, like that is a, a relationship that's that's new and it's exciting and we're co-creating and that's that can be very helpful for people. But then to look at it as societal change can be, I struggle with this and, and still work on balancing this often, like it can be so overwhelming to take that systemic view because it is kind of depressing, I think, um, sometimes to look at where things are or the the trends of things or, capitalism and, and all these things that that are taking away relationships or limiting or making relationships more rigid than they need to be um so i think cultivating that that ability to promote relational learning and help people not just in the therapy room but in any place and so my role as a therapist relational your role as an educator like introducing these concepts and sharing them with people i think Sometimes you get pushed back, as you mentioned, having a student who's angry, but it it does open so many more doors for people than they maybe realized were there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, while, yes, you know, it can be depressing to think about all these larger issues, at the same time, it can be really liberating for people to, to say, oh, this isn't my flaw, my personal flaw. This is, you know, something happening. And I think what... Um, the piece that's been missing in therapy for a long time, but now, thankfully, it, it's not, I don't think, is, you know, we we focused on the micro level, you know, on, on what's going on in a person's life, in a family, in a couple, and, you know, looking at those dynamics, and, you know, a little bit in the context of society or the community they live in, but that was less so. And now, you know, it's, what we see is that it's what we do that keeps those macro discourses or ways of being alive. So, you know, I always give this silly example. If, if, um, if we stopped, all of us just stopped sending our children to school, the idea of education as we know it would cease to exist. You know, that if we stopped going to doctors when we felt ill, the medical prof profession would cease to exist. Now, that's not going to happen because you're not going to get everybody stopping that kind of thing. But it does show how, you know, the, in our unquestioning way that, you know, oh, I don't feel good. I'll call the doctor. Oh, I, I'm having a problem in my relationship. I need a good therapist. Um, those kind of knee jerk responses go unquestioned. And and because they go unquestioned, those larger ideologies of how we should what we should do when x happens remain in place and nothing changes and so i think it is can be liberating for people to to say well let's deconstruct this who says it's normal to do blah 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 you know and engage in that kind of conversation in the therapy room with people could you know could actually open up this view of how we all are part of keeping the very things we don't like alive you know as, as you know as a therapist like you know you can <laughs> both members of a couple contribute to keeping their unwanted pattern alive it's not one person's fault they're both involved so yeah. right yeah and it's 
it's it's interesting i think too when clients because clients do come in that way clients come in expecting a diagnosis or even looking for a diagnosis help help me make sense of this by giving it a label um and some of those conversations are are very freeing and opening for people when you start to question and unpack those things um deconstruct some of it i work with religious trauma so we use the term deconstruction all the time mm. um but it's it's one of those things that also is like like you mentioned earlier makes people uncomfortable because it moves away from some black and white thinking or some overly simplistic thinking I still, even after doing this and working this way, most of my, I mean, my whole career, I was introduced to the social construction stuff while I was in grad school. So working this way, like there are so many people who still, why are we talking about the way we're languaging or like even dislike, disliking kind of like, well, let's have a dialogue because they, there's comfort in, if you give me this diagnosis, then I know what to do about it. Yeah. Yeah. That That's back to the point we were discussing earlier about certainty. You know, just saying, oh, you know, now I know. And in fact, you know, my view is that diagnosis in and of itself isn't always bad. I mean, for some people, it is exactly liberating, like, oh my gosh, I'm dep clinically depressed. Now I know what to do, you know, uh, where for someone else, it's going to be a tailspin, you know, and, and you never know. And, and so, and also, there's just so much out there now. Uh, I just, read recently well in the last year a really wonderful book uh what's it called anyway it's about a, a journalist and her experience in the mental health system and um and you know she and many others make a, a make a great point that this is not like a disease you know like in medicine where you can see that there's a virus in the body i mean there's there's no no physical evidence for any kind of quote unquote mental illness or mental diagnosis. Um, so it's really kind of amazing how that that people really believe, you know, that just because a group of psychiatrists can, you know, over decades have gotten together and identified and defined and named um, that that really is something it's pretty yeah. amazing. <laughs> and and something that it wasn't designed for if you're talking about like the the dsm was designed as a research tool so that we were right organizing people in the same groups for research to to eliminate some uh variables not ever as a a diagnostic tool for the purpose of diagnosing or or clinical um techniques so that's always weird and it, it's weird too at, at this point I would say at this time in history for how many people I've interviewed um, for the podcast or just in general therapists who like have no knowledge of the history of the DSM because yeah. it is just now ingrained as like, well, this is this is how you do therapy, you diagnose. And so not looking at that historical view and saying like, this was kind of arbitrary, like this was just these people's idea on what was going to be helpful, not like objective yeah. truth, not capital T truth. I know. I mean, this is, I mean, it's the amazing thing about all of these unquestioned beliefs that, that uh, circulate around us that, you know, as long as you don't question and you don't go back, you know, do sort of the Foucauldian archaeology of knowledge, like, how did this start? You know, oh, you know, you know, like the perfect example, you know, do you know why we use utensils to eat? Well, if you do the archaeology of knowledge, and you go back, you know, way back in time and hear people coming in from the battlefield and sticking their germy hands into the center dish and, you know, spreading disease. Like, that's why we have, it's not that, oh, this is proper and the right way to do things. It's, it was a very practical reason. And this the same of the DSM or anything else. And again, we come back to the, that curiosity, like, you know, curiosity instead of certainty. If we could imbue ourselves and the people we work with with curiosity, I think we'd be um, a much better, uh, we'd be living in a much better way with each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> I love finding uh, and talking, having these conversations with like-minded people because it's very validating and, and uplifting. Um, 
I think one of the the pushbacks I get from clients often, so not other professionals or not academics, but clients around kind of these ideas around social construction um, and some of the postmodern stuff is they immediately jump to, well, then nothing has any meaning. And I think that's <laughs> to quickly like address, like that's not that's not the end result. Like that's not the goal or that's not the, the drive for questioning these things is to say that nothing has meaning, but to acknowledge that like the meaning is co-created. The, the, there are all these different contributors to why we think something has meaning. And if we don't pull that apart and look at it, then we're presupposing a lot of information. Yeah, wow. I mean, that is the most common response like oh it's meaningless or oh you don't like something just just make it up make up some other you know thing and and uh, my response to that is always uh to say that we live in a world of multiple realities multiple meanings is not to say there is no meaning or reality this is what we are doing now is so incredibly real and it could be other you know? And so there's nothing more real than what we are doing in any given moment, in any interaction with others in particular contexts and histories and cultures and so forth. And, and, but there's always possibilities of alternatives. And that's the point of social construction. It's not to say there is no reality. And it's really unfortunate that, that, that that's how people hear it. You know, they hear, you saying, no, this isn't a reality. Um, there is no reality. Everything's relative. It's whatever you want it to be. Um, you know, I, I would say to undergraduate students, you know, if I, if I said, you know, I'm the president of the United States, um, unless other people go along with that, collaborate with that construction of myself, um, I will probably be taken to an insane asylum, you know, I would not, you know, you can't just declare something and there it is, that's rampant relativism and that's not social construction. Social construction means negotiating, engaging with others in the creation of, of a reality that, by the way, all people who've coordinated in that negotiation don't necessarily have the same understanding of what it is, you know, either. So um, th that notion of diversity and variety and multiplicity just is always there. And, and again, back to, you know, if that's the case, then we need to be curious. Like I love Tom Anderson would say, if someone would say to him, I'm so depressed instead of just, you know, like most of us go, oh, you are, you know, it's sort of because we know what that is. But he wouldn't go there. He would say, when you look into the word depression, what other words do you see? Because he didn't want to presume that his understanding of depression was the same as the client's understanding of depression. And so mm -hmm. that is that it's that move of sort of recognizing so much, uh, so many different meanings and understandings yeah and and you 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 have hinted at this earlier that opens up doors that creates freedom that's that's freeing that's not we're not limiting things in that so it's not taking away meaning it's opening up the possibility for additional or new meaning yeah yeah definitely absolutely um, i'm going to shift a little bit um some of your work has been around um, appreciative uh, relating or in, uh, appreciative inquiry. Uh, and I've, I've experienced a lot of that in a different realm, working as a, a, a coach. I coach women's volleyball at the collegiate level. Hmm. What, what was, how did sort of that come into a lot of people at Taos Institute were a part of writing that book. It's, it's a short little book, the uh, appreciative organizations like 90 pages or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but it's so dense with these ideas. It's it's fascinating to me how it's this this guidebook really on how to kind of reshape an organization so that it's healthier and it's more creative. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of how that came up and and where those ideas kind of joined from all those different creators? Yeah, it's uh, it's a good story. So it goes back to the um, creation of the Taos Institute, actually. So um, 
uh, Ken and Mary Gergen had a friend, have a friend, uh, Diana Whitney, who was living in Taos, New Mexico. This was back in 1992. Uh, and, um, or maybe, it, yeah. And they went uh, to go ski after the uh, Christmas holidays out there and came back and Ken gave me a call and said, hey, you know, Taos is a great place. We all love to ski. What if we do a conference out there? Uh, you know, we put on this conference and you'd really like our friend Diana, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, sure, let's do that. And then he made that same phone call to a few other people, uh, another one being David Cooper Ryder and another one being Harleen Anderson. And so, you know, we kind of gathered, we had no institutional uh, or organizing entity to sponsor this conference. This was just us. And we thought, well, we'll see if anybody comes. And I don't know if you've ever been to Taos, New Mexico, but it's not an easy place to get to. And um, <clears throat> we had, I think 150 or 200 people came to this conference. And at the end of the conference, we were sitting around at dinner and Ken said, what if we become an institute? And we all looked at him and said, why? <laughs> and he said, why, what would we do? Well, we could have conferences, we could, you know, we talked about it. We said, okay, let's try for three years and see what, what happens. Okay, so that was the beginning of the Taos Institute. But David Cooper Ryder is the person with his uh, PhD supervisor who created this notion of appreciative inquiry. And he, it emerged out of the social constructionist orientation that says, you know, the way in which we talk and relate to one another makes a difference. And so if we're always talking about problems and problem solving and what caused the problem, what do we need to do to re resolve the problem, we are mired in a problem saturated reality. If instead we ask the question, what's working here? What gives us joy? What gives us life? Then we can do more of that. And by the way, and there are lots of stories that could be told about this, but you know, when you focus on that, all of a sudden the problem is solved because you're doing more of what works in a, in a given community or organization. And so that's how appreciative inquiry came into my work and um, why it's so much a part of the Taos Institute because it's based on the, on social construction uh, in terms of looking at language. And when I say language, I mean all embodied activity, not just words, but you know, all that we do. And, um, and, and noticing that that makes a difference. So you talk, you talk about what works, what gives joy, what brings life, what's fulfilling. Um, and you can do more of that. And the more you do of that, the, the less you confront the same old challenges. Yeah. But and it, go ahead. I was just going to say, but it's different than positive psychology. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not just, oh, happy, happy. We'll, we won't talk about problems. It's not if people want to talk about problems, you talk about the problems. But in the context of talking about the problems, can you also talk about, you know, those exceptional moments? Like, when did you do something when the problem didn't pop up? You know, oh, how did you do that? You know, some of the narrative uh, therapy uh, ways of dealing with things, exceptions. Yeah. And I think it's, it, it was intuitively coming from a, a social construction background. It made sense. And I'm neurodivergent. So I think that's a piece. And all of us do have ADHD. So like looking at things, I've always been that outside the box thinker. Um, mm -hmm. What other people gave me that label, but like a lot of these things made sense then because it's looking at some of the relational interplay for a sports team, you know, coaching a team of of 30 people and having different roles on the team, but also having different personalities, having different motivations. Um, mm -hmm. Athletes, some of them like to win, some of them hate to lose. Those are different things. Some of them want their teammates to be happy. So like you have all these different motivations and getting into a point of uh, appreciative inquiry and, and what do we do well and how do we build on those things? It's so weird uh, to see the process work because it's like, right, the 
we're not talking about problems all of a sudden. A lot of the problems have cleaned themselves up. And yeah. when problems arise, we have such a healthier, more productive way of working through them rather than just like, let's sit down and all the focus goes to the problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's kind of a no brainer, right? You know, once, once you step into that space of, you know, what, who are we at our best? Uh, and how do we do more of that? It's contagious. And you think, well, why didn't, weren't we thinking this way all along? I mean, it, it is kind of a, uh, reminds me of that, that cartoon. I don't know if you've ever seen it of these two scientists at a, at a blackboard and this big long formula and in the middle, it says, and then a miracle occurs. And one scientist is saying to the other scientist, I think you need to be a little more precise in that middle section there, you know, but, but it is, it's sort of like, uh, you know, wow, this is, this, this works, you know, to talk about what is going well, um, really helps redirect attention and focus and make possible you know, the movement forward for a group, an organization, a team, what have you. Yeah. And I think it's the difference from positive psychology is it's it's not just like a bag of tricks. It's not just technique and steer the conversation one way, because I do think there's a an art or a, a component of like being present in this process and genuine in this process. Otherwise, it doesn't work as well. Right. Um, whereas just kind of like, bullishly saying we're just going to talk about good things and that almost becomes toxic in itself of that just positive yeah. you know only good vibes kind of mentality yeah. that yeah. falls apart because it's disingenuous and so the appreciative inquiry is much more about authentic approaching of how do we come together and create something together that works better yeah absolutely you know i i've worked with a lot of different groups you know in a consulting role and um several times, you know, sort of taken an appreciative inquiry approach. And, you know, I prepare people, you know, before they come together and ask them, you know, there's a whole, there's a number of things I ask people to reflect on before they come. So they come in, in the right mindset. And then we finally come together and I say, okay, so, you know, what are the strengths or, you know, something like that. And uh, some inevitably someone will raise their hand and say, oh, we can't talk about that until we've talk about the problem. You know, even though I've done all this preparation uh, beforehand to why we're not going to go there. So, <clears throat> but I never resisted. I say, okay, you're right. Let's, let's talk about the problem. What are the things we must talk about? And I write them down on a flip chart or something. And <clears throat> once everybody's said what they think we need to focus on, you know, with, around the problem, and I just ask permission. I say, can can I have your permission to pause this and we'll devote, you know, X amount of time in a couple of hours. But for now, we do this and everybody is always fine because they, they trust, you know, OK, my voice has been heard and we're going to do this. Um, and then at the end of the day, when I say, OK, we need to now go back to this, you know, every single time the group always says, Oh no, we don't need to talk about that anymore. We're we're good. <laughs> we're fine. We're yeah. already in a in another space now. So so yeah, it's not about not talking about problems. It's it's about how you manage that. Yeah. And it's sports is a fantastic avenue for it because it it's such a each team is its own little ecosystem. Um I was the director of of student athlete mental wellness and kind of, I think, the classic modernist pushback on a lot of those things. Well, what ha what if we have a player who's not following the rules or, you know, all these like that won't work for this reason. And then when you get the team together to sit down and kind of go through these things, like those reasons kind of evaporate. Not that they don't exist anymore, but that we're, the, the problem solving looks so different that it it's not relevant to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, the classic uh, child rearing redirection, right? <laughs> like yeah. when, when your kids are acting up, you redirect them to something else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sheila, what, what, um, working as an educator, working at, with the Taos Institute, working um, as a collaborator and all these different avenues you've gotten to, kind of how do you 
manage your own mental process? Like, how do you check in with yourself? How do you kind of take care of yourself and make sure that you have the energy and the space for some of these heavy or taxing or, or uh, vulnerable conversations that, that you're a part of? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> probably I don't take care of myself in that way, to be honest. <laughs> um, I'm kind of hard on myself. Um, I have overly high expectations, I think, for myself. Um, <clears throat> but I would say what saves me is my relations, the, my community. So, you know, the Taos community is an amazing, supportive, and life-giving kind of community. And so I know that there are always people that can, you know, will listen and talk, talk through, you know, a current challenge. But also, I think while I, mm, while I can have some doubts about things, I, I generally just plow forward. And so I don't, I try not to give much space to, to, to doubt or to, um, now I'm sounding like I, I take the stance of certainty, but I don't mean that either. I, um, I, I think, I guess optimism is the best word that I just, I, I trust that things are going to work out. And, um, you know, earlier when I was younger, I would uh, perseverate over things and worry and worry and worry and worry. And now uh, I'd say the last three or so decades, my uh, motto is don't worry until you have to, because it's exhausting and takes a lot of energy. And so, um, you know, I, I, I look at things to, so a personal example, um, right ar around the start of the pandemic, my husband was diagnosed with an aggressive prostate cancer. And, you know, it, it was pretty hell to, you know, uh, I had to um, drop him at the door of the hospital in Boston for his surgery. I couldn't go in. Um, he was raised in a religion that doesn't believe in medicine. And so he was like panicked, you know, uh, it's it just the whole thing. And so every day, you know, I, it, it, I would not overly worry. I was concerned, but you know, you kind of move through one day at a time. And I think that that saved me and saved us, you know, to be able to do what needed to be done in that in any given moment um, without paralyzing um, myself with fear, you know, fear of mm -hmm. of death, of loss, of whatever. Um, so I think that sort of tr just trusting, tr trusting the relations and trusting the process um, are ways that I try to navigate the challenges I confront. Yeah, I love it. As you were talking, I just kept thinking, trust the process, trust the process. Like, yeah, it's uh, a great old phrase. <laughs> it's so, again, it's one of these things that I think for people who aren't coming at it from this perspective, it sounds so foreign to just say like, well, if we're, we're being intentional and we're being authentic and we're trusting the process, like we don't have much to worry about. Like that almost sounds magical. <laughs> and yet, uh, once you get into it and you're practicing it and you experience success with it, it becomes so much easier than, yeah. you know, perseverating or, or putting our energy towards things that we can't control. Exactly. I, you know, and I think that that's a key point. What you just said is things we can't control. Um, you know, in a medical situation like that, what can you control? Nothing. You know, you don't know what the result of a surgery is going to be or diagnose, you know, it, so why put yourself and others through that? Um, and again, you know, I think it's another theme for, for, for us who, you know, are in this postmodern relational way of being is it's not just trusting the process, but it's, it's having faith that, you know, things, things won't always work out, but you'll find a way to move forward. Why? Because you believe 
that others are there to help you. So it's, it, you're not alone. And I think that that's critically important. And un, unfortunately, you know, as long as people stay in the kind of neoliberal ideology, they are alone and they do have to solve the problem on their own. And if crisis, you know, falls on them, they don't have anyone to turn to. And, and um, that's sad. That's really sad. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I just had this thought that that crisis is a lack of community. Like when these things come up and you are feeling alone or you don't have the support that you need, like that's where some a a problem becomes a crisis. Yeah, yeah. And I love the uh, Chinese symbol for crisis is uh, danger and opportunity. It's two symbols put together, danger and opportunity. Right. And that I think that summarizes it pretty nicely. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is such a, uh, expansive topic cause it really can go, you can apply it anywhere. Um, Sheila, this, this has been so much fun. Um, I got to do a training with you and Harleen a couple of years ago, which was really, uh, a fantastic thing. One of the silver linings of the pandemic was some of those things were virtual. Um, yeah. um, you brought something up and as long as I think we have a little bit of time, I want to talk about it a little bit, uh, therapist is social activist like the new work and, and some of the things you're focused on currently um is does that feel like a shift in perspective for the field or do you think that's there and it's just talking about it differently i i think it's a shift in the field um i think there have been, there have always been some people who have seen their work, their therapeutic work as a form of social activism. So it's not brand new for everyone, but I think this is really a direction that it, the, the, our contemporary situation demands it, you know, with all the challenges that we face and the ways in which those challenges at a global level impinge on people's livelihoods and their, their well being. So I think that is something new and it has serious implications for ethics, you know, like the code of ethics for, you know, we have a case in the book, um, practicing therapy of social construction of uh, Emerson, my colleague in Brazil, working with uh, AIDS patients. Uh, and they were cut out of some service by the local government. And he actually stepped out of his role as therapist and joined them in a letter writing campaign and a lot of political activism that actually gained them the services that they needed. Um, and and that, you know, some people will say, well, that's not your role as a therapist. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, and so I think that th this new notion of, of, of activism for the therapist raises questions about some of our tried and true, you know, idols like ethics and so forth. Yeah. And uh uh informed consent and confidentiality like those things are designed to protect the clients but often i think they protect the status quo or, or the systems that are um exist in society right now so that change on a systemic level isn't occurring yeah exactly exactly so i mean i i think we're on the precipice of some maybe another revolution like i was lucky enough when i was young to be feel like i was part of maybe maybe this is you know really getting going now i i would hope that because i do see more and more people uh seeing their work as much more than just helping a couple or a family or an individual yeah and i think a lot of therapists and i have a selective process for getting guests on and finding therapists who are practicing from inclusive spaces like a lot of therapists have as kind of the the thrust of my question earlier is like i think a lot of therapists are aware of the the uh social injustice that happens because they see it play out in their clients lives and so it's a, a unique profession i think to see so many different people at such a deep level and see how the systems um some of these ideologies that we we presuppose as being normal that they're not normal nor are they healthy and so i think it's it's a great 
uh, step forward for the profession for therapists to say, we have all this knowledge about social injustice. Uh, how do we activate? How do we organize so that we can uh, enact some change? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Great. Well, Sheila, this is this has been awesome. I'm so appreciative of you taking the time to to chat today and all the work that you do uh, in and around the field of therapy. Thanks, Jeremy. I mean, it's it's really been fun talking with you. I I, I hope everything made sense. But, um, yeah, I've you have such it. a, a it's fascinating because I think you can read some of this this content and if, even people who like maybe go back and read Foucault and, and Derrida and some of those postmodern thinkers like it seems really heavy, but then I love conversing with you because it's so approachable when we're just talking about it. It's not this heavy philosophy that it maybe sometimes appears to be. Yeah, thanks. That I mean, that's that's a high, high, very high compliment because this stuff can get very heady, and uh, it it's really important to talk about it in terms of like everyday our everyday lives and how how these ideas are useful. So. These are these are great topics for people who are interested in in learning more. For people who want to engage with some of these these conversations, where can they find your work? Where can they find the things you're you're doing currently? Uh, good question. So yeah, there's there are things on the Taos website, the Taos Institute website. If you just Google Taos Institute, um, and you know under my name there. It hasn't been updated for a long time, but there are articles. I had a website and the university just is transitioning it to a new platform. And um, I so I don't it hasn't happened yet. So but but um, eventually and I hope very soon I have a lot of some videos and uh, articles, publications and so forth. Uh, there. But I would say probably the easiest thing to do is just Google my name and various things pop up. So um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we'll have we'll have some links in the show notes. The Taoist Institute has a, a pretty big list, um, maybe not most current, but a big list of a lot of, you know, everybody who I think is on the board has a, a subsection for articles and PDFs that are free and accessible to people. And then obviously the links for publications, the books and, and things like that. But Right. I think it's it's such a fascinating topic and for therapists who are or anyone in a helping profession, anyone in general, but specifically in helping professions like this uh, way of being, this way of approaching things is is so enriching that if it's it's interesting, I encourage people to learn more about it. Yeah, let me just there are two other things I wanted to share. One is um, I just published a few months ago a book called Practicing Therapy as Social Construction. Uh, with two of my colleagues from Brazil. And um, that, you know, is Therapy of Social Construction, or the original edited book with that I did with Ken Gergen um, was published in 92. And this is, you know, 30 years later, and it's not edited. It's a written, we wrote the book, and it's, it's, I think it's very practical and very, it's also got a real political edge to it, which I think is really important for us to consider. That's a, a, another thing. But the other is the Taos Institute has now a platform called the Taos Institute Commons. And uh, it's an online platform and anyone can join that. And um, <clears throat> if um, just, I guess if you Google the Taos Institute Commons, you'll find a way to get to it and you can uh, sign up for it. And there are, we have dialogues with the authors and house conversations. Anybody could offer, you know, and say, I wanna talk about X, Y, or Z. So, and there are resources and materials and all sorts of things available there. So uh, I would encourage people to look into that. Yeah, and it's as somebody who's done some of the trainings and gotten to sit in on some of the, the conversations with authors like these are fantastic uh resources that by and large are free for people to to join in and so it's a great way to get access to things like i've picked up several books just because yeah i had a chance to talk to the author uh so it's a very cool way to engage with these this content um highly recommend it we'll have we'll have links for that stuff in the show notes thanks for the opportunity yeah, I appreciate having you on. And for all the listeners out there, make sure to check out those links in the show notes. And uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another new episode. Take care, everyone.